All right, I guess we'll get started. So today I'm going to cover uh, the second order system and damping. I'll look at the two other cases we didn't look at on Friday, which were critically damped and over damped systems. And then we'll move on to uh, finally control theory, <laughs> I guess, and look at feedback control. What does it mean to do feedback control? And overview of feedback control and the constraints. And then the next lecture on Wednesday, we'll go into uh, different types of uh, feedback control systems, what are called classical control systems. Uh, and we, we'll see what that means in a bit. But today is kind of the main, the main point I want to get across is what does it mean to do feedback control and why is it important? And uh, it's actually a, probably at the heart of everything you do in control theory. But uh, let's just continue damping for a minute. Uh, so what I discussed last time was the second order system. And the second order system, the transfer function is given as uh, gs or ys equals uh, k over s this purpose 2as by omega plus, um, let me get this right, 1, OK where we define k to be the gain. Omega is the natural frequency. And A is the damping factor. And the gain tells you, if you give a step input of unit height, what is the magnitude of the output, OK? Generally speaking, that's what gain is. So if you, it basically amplifies the input by some value, so that's a gain. The natural frequency is that if there's an oscillation, what is the frequency at which it oscillates? That's omega. And then A is a damping factor, and we basically study four cases for damping factor. When uh, in A equals zero, we call it undamped, <coughs> and then the output is a sinusoidal oscillation, so it's sinusoidal. So this is uh, output. And we looked at it already. When 0 is less than a is less than 1, then we call it uh, underdamped. And the output is a uh, decaying sinusoid. So in this is a sinusoidal oscillation. A decaying sinusoid is going to look like this. And of course, this is offset by k because the gain is k. So we're going to have asymptotically reaching k anyway, but it's going to be a decaying sinusoid at the level of k. This is going to be um, magnitude of k over here. Um, when it's a equals 1, then it's called critically damped. And we, we'll, I'll show that in a minute. And when it's critically damped, we have this very nice behavior where the system starts at initially at, at, the equal, at zero, because we assume it starts at zero, and it reaches, asymptotically reaches the critical value. And finally, when A is greater than one, then we call it overdamped. And what happens in this case is that we, uh, it, it reaches a critical value, it reaches the asymptote more and more slowly, okay? It takes forever, okay? And it has this family of curves. I'll show those curves in a bit, uh, in, in a bit more detail. I just want to show you how the whole thing looks like. So let's go to the case of critical damping. And to study that, we, we, write, uh, we write ys equals k omega squared. So I'm just moving omega squared to the top. And uh, we get uh, s squared plus 2 omega s plus um, omega square. And so what happens is I just said a equals 1 over here. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. In the over system, in real life, if you have stuff like static friction, is it possible that we never reach the asymptote? Uh, if you have friction, that would reduce the gain. Okay, so the gain would be, so the asymptote would be reached to a different level. Okay, so in a, in a frictionless environment, you would reach a particular 
uh, level. Remember what's happening is we have step input we're looking at. So we are giving constant power into the system at a unit value. So the friction can be viewed as uh, rem removing a certain amount of energy in the form of heat. So you would, the gain would be diminished, but uh, you would say it's reaching an asymptote, but a lower asymptote, right? And the gap between the two would be the uh, heat loss, right? Yeah, so that's typically how that would work out. So you would still reach an asymptote, and you would say, yeah, it'll never reach the true asymptote, that's true, but the gap between the two is, is the friction loss. Any other questions? Okay, so what we, I'm just setting A to 1 over here, and then uh, the, the step input, I need to multiply this by 1 over S. And then I can write this as, uh, in, the, in the form of partial fraction as S minus omega over S plus omega square uh, minus 1 over S plus omega. And the reason is because, as you can see, this is just a perfect square. S squared plus 2 omega S plus omega squared is just S plus omega squared. So I can finally uh, have three colors today. I'm really super prepared. Okay, there you go. <laughs> okay. So this is uh, S plus omega squared. So when you have something in the square, what will happen is that the partial fraction will be S plus omega squared plus S plus omega. And this, when you take it into the time domain, will give us Yt equals um, k times. So this term gives you 1. This term gives you minus omega t e to the minus omega t. And so you'll have that extra omega t e to the minus omega t uh, minus e to the minus omega t. And this is just straightforward if you look it up because uh, that, that, you know, the, 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 this particular thing is just uh, the uh, d, d by dx or 1 over s plus omega. It's the first derivative, so we get the omega t to the minus omega t term from there. So that's yt. So if you, if you ignore the, uh, how we got there for just a moment and look at the form of this, what we have is essentially what's important here is these two terms. These are two um, exponential terms which have no complex components. This is e to the minus omega t. Omega is real. That's a real. Okay. So even though we're seeing it in omega, which is, which is the natural frequency as we called it, yet what we really have is the uh, difference between two exponential values. Okay, it's difference between two exponential values that are both real decaying exponentials, and so we don't get any sinusoidal oscillation. So if I look at this graph over here, I'm going to redraw that graph for the critically damped case. So we have time over here on the y-axis is y of t, and we have some value k. We start at zero, and we're going to nice and clean get over here, and there'll be no oscillation because we have no oscillatory components, right? Whereas in the case of the undamped system and the underdamped system in both cases, we are going to have uh, an omega t, a cos omega t or sine omega t component, which is going to give you these oscillations, okay? And so uh, this is, in some sense, the ideal behavior. This is where we want to get to. We want to damp it just right. And you'll see why it's ideal, because when you look at the overdamped case, you'll see what the problem is. But for now, um, I wonder what is remarkable is that though we started with a pretty straightforward equation, just this one, which at first looks kind of obscure, you'll see that with just one control knob, you can get either a sinusoid like this, or you can get a clean rise like this, just from the partial fractal, expa uh, partial fraction expansion. So the, this equation hides inside it some really beautiful behavior. And that's really why a second order system is so nice. You can, uh, it looks a bit complicated at first, but once you look into it, you see that you can get, uh, you can pretty much predict whether the system is going to oscillate or whether it's going to die down. And the other uh, part that comes out of this is the realization that the exponential function contains inside it both the helix, if it has a complex component, and uh, in the, in the, when it's real, just a standard exponential like this. Okay, this is a 1 minus e to the minus x, nice asymptote formula, and, and, and so they're both inside the exponential. Okay, and that's why it's such a beautiful signal to work with. That's why we spend so much time setting the complex exponential, because it shows up and, and we can get uh, oscillations or, or, or not. Okay. And, and uh, that's something that's not obvious. If somebody were to tell you this one function where with some knob setting you get an oscillation, in other case you don't, it shows up, you know, this is exactly what you have over here. Okay. 
Now, in the case of the overdamped system, what happens is that omega is greater than 1. Uh, sorry, A is greater than 1. Uh, A is what I've been calling, uh, I guess in the book I'm calling it zeta. Uh, can you see this over here? Yeah? Over, I can write. Okay. So, in the case of overdamped, A greater than 1, then we write Ys as uh, k omega square by s times s square plus 2a omega s plus omega square. And here what you need to do is to essentially factorize this using the quadratic formula. And you write this as k omega square over s times. Um, so the roots are going to be over here. So minus b minus 2a plus minus square root of b squared is 4a square omega square minus 4a is 1, c is omega square, 4 omega square by 2a, which is 2, OK? And so you, pull, you can cancel out the 2s and the 4 in the square root. So that goes away, that goes away. And then the omega comes out, and so this becomes minus a plus minus omega square root of a square minus 1, OK? And we'll, we, just for convenience, we're going to write square, uh, this square root of a square minus 1 as gamma. So it's going to be minus a plus minus omega square root of, sorry, omega gamma, OK? So if you write it this way, then the denominator becomes s uh, plus Sorry, so the denominator becomes S plus uh, A omega plus omega gamma times S plus A omega minus omega gamma. And if you take the partial fraction and you expand it, you'll get a fairly complicated looking term, which is Yt equals K times. So we get one term in 1 over S, so that becomes 1 in the time domain. We get one term in something over s plus a omega plus omega gamma. And uh, so anyway, I'll just write down the final thing over minus uh, a plus gamma omega t over 2 gamma a plus gamma minus e to the minus a minus gamma omega t over 2 gamma. OK, so it's a bit complicated looking. And I'm not going to uh, do, if you, if you kind of work through the steps, this is the final answer you get. What I'd like you to focus on is the, is the nature of what it is. Remember, gamma is just square root of a squared minus 1. So it's a constant, OK? And a is a constant. So this whole thing over here is a constant, OK? You can just call it c if you want. And there's, another, there's some other constant, c prime. So this is just uh, uh, exponential, OK, with some other constant and this another exponential. So it's the difference of two exponential curves, which happens to be an exponential as well. And so we're basically doing 1 plus exponential minus exponential, OK? And so what you get is that as you increase a, you get a family of curves which go like this. And this is a, a increases in this direction. OK? And so what's happening is that you are getting these rises, but the rises are taking longer and longer because you are, you are uh, damping it. Okay? That's the meaning of damping. You are uh, preventing it from rising as fast as you want. Okay? So uh, this factor A turns out to be the critical factor in, in what you're trying to do. If you set A to be very small, Okay, then we get something that oscillates. Okay, it, it's going to oscillate. If it's at a to zero, it just oscillates all the time like this. If you set a to be between zero and one, the oscillations die down eventually. If you set a to be equal to one, you get this nice rise. If you set a larger than one, it takes too long. So we have this trade-off. Okay, what's the trade-off? It's between sensitivity or reactivity, uh, response, res responsiveness, and stability. So if you make it very unresponsive, that's great. You'll, you know, eventually will get there, OK? And you won't have any oscillation, but it takes too long. If you set it 
too low, it will respond right away, but you get these oscillations. Okay, so you kind of have to tune it. Okay, problem is we don't know the system parameters are. Okay, and in the homework example, which I'll do in just a moment, what you'll see is that what you've done over there is that you know we say okay if you knew the parameter system exactly we could choose these control knobs so we get just the right thing but you don't know what it is okay and choosing the value of a is therefore a very important thing but at the same time it's very hard to do so what you can do is you can do it empirically you can set the responsiveness uh, in into uh, very low and it'll, it'll oscillate okay and then you say okay I'm going to keep increasing the value of a till it's very 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 good and then if you set it too high you're going to have too slow a rise okay so I'm going to <laughs> uh, give you a footnote on this you know relevant to what's happening in current affairs so we can view uh, we can view administration and government as a control system okay so what's happening is that we have a, a, a law that is passed is essentially or you know some political output is output of a system so we have the we have a system Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a democratic or non-democratic system, doesn't matter. We have some input, which is the wishes of the people, and then some output, which is the laws. Okay, so uh, let's take an example of, uh, I mean, I'll take a simple example to begin with, this roundabout, you know, I don't know how many people read the newspaper here, but there's this roundabout in the south of us in Kitchener, where there's a lot of controversy. Should it be a roundabout or a traffic light? Okay, so everybody has their own wishes, but the output is binary, either you have a roundabout or you have a traffic light, you can't have both. Okay, you can't have a superposition of states. You can have either one or the other. And so one can imagine a system which is very responsive. So you, have a, you, you do a poll on, let's say, uh, I don't know, e uh, uh, on, on some, a, a website, you know, Doodle. You know, everybody signs on to Doodle, puts an electronic registration. They say, all right, 51% want a roundabout. And you, know, you put in a roundabout. And then uh, two months later, they say, you know what, the people who voted weren't really traffic engineers. They had no idea. They've changed their mind. They all want a traffic light. So let's go back and put a traffic light instead. And then two months later, they say, you know, that wasn't very good either. So you have this, what? Oscillatory behavior. Okay. So what we do in society to prevent waste, because oscillations generally are wasteful, is to add damping to it. So you say, okay, you have a proposition, fine. We're going to have an open house. You can argue about it. And it's going to take us two years to make a decision. In that two years, what will happen is hopefully all the wacky ideas are going to go away, okay, because they have a high decay rate. Okay? The people who have wacky ideas have high energy, but also the A is very high. Oh, sorry, they're, they're, uh, <laughs> the exponential is pretty high. So they have a lot of energy and they dissipate. Okay? But <laughs> The low end, the transients, which are not, uh, the steady state response is going to maintain. So if there's enough support, you'll have enough kind of thing going on so that over time that will come through and you'll make a reasonable decision. And that's why one reason why most countries have what's called a bicameral legislature. You have a lower house and an upper house. Okay, you have, in Canada, we have the parliament and the senate. In the US, you have the congress and the senate. And most countries have two. Okay, uh, It's not just because they wanted to have it, you know, or because uh, in the UK they had the House of Lords and they just put it in. The, the upper house is, is a damping factor, okay? The purpose of upper house is precisely to prevent uh, having a, a very fast response and oscillation. So you can imagine, you know, uh, these people who invented the second house of parliament uh, were not control theorists, okay? But they have intuitive grasp of, of oscillation and damping. And what's happened is that the value of A is very important. So if you have this, this is basically a representative democracy with only one house of parliament. So people say, okay, one roundabout, boom, you got it. Okay, and then next day they don't, and then you can oscillate. That's not so good. And this happens in the dictatorship because there is no second house of parliament. Okay, so if Gaddafi wants a roundabout, he gets it. And if he changes his mind, he gets that too. Okay, so you dissipate all your money Okay, in, in these oscillatory behaviors, okay, this happens in all dictatorships pretty much, okay, more or less, all dictatorships. There are exceptions. Singapore is an exception where, you know, there's a dictatorship, but, you know, they were, they were smart about it. But so certainly Saudi Arabia is not an uh, exemplary dictatorship, <laughs> okay. This is a better, more dampened, okay, so you have, you know, some oscillation, but you know, sanity prevails in the end. This is perfect, okay? And, and now this is the US with the overdamped system. They can't change because the damping is so high. They have this three-way system, right? 
where the judicial and the executive and the legislature are all fighting with each other all the time. And so the designers of the US Constitution overdamped the system. Okay, so they can't get any change unless some huge problem happens. They have a big war and then the damping factor goes away and the executive order, you know, they have the new deal or whatever and then they can get into a critically damped, in some cases, undamped system. Okay, this is the Tea Party right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, one candidate, she goes down and up, you know, the next candidate <laughs> goes down and up. Okay, and that's uh, the two sinusoidal. And, and so, so a, a good appreciation of second order systems is actually Im very interesting to read the newspaper and to see what the damping factor is. Okay. So understanding this equation is not just an issue of understanding the math, it's also understanding politics, society, you know, what's happening and you know, how people behave. It's quite interesting to see what uh, rules have been put into place precisely to prevent this, but then they get in the way and you're over there. So you have to adjust the damping factor to match the situation. Okay, so uh, let me do the homework problem and then we'll, we'll take a break. So the homework problem was, was to, uh, so we had a, the same velocity situation where we had a accelerator, so the velocity V uh, but except I changed it a little bit and I said that the, what did I say over here? I said that, um, so, so A D square Y by D T square plus B D Y by D T plus, uh, sorry, plus one equals X T. So I did this so that we can, if you take the uh, Laplace transform, we get A S square Y S plus B S Y S, okay, uh, sorry, this is plus Y T, what am I doing here, yes, yeah, plus Y S equals X of S, so that the transfer function is 1 over A S square plus B S plus 1. If the transfer function looks like this, then we can just pattern match with this transfer function over here, okay, to find that um, uh, omega equals one over square root of A, okay, just pattern matching because you want A S square to be uh, S square over omega square, so omega is one over square root A, and so that's the natural frequency of the system. And then the second one was what value of, uh, what value makes it critically damped? Well, so, uh, a shows up over here, 2As over omega, so we want 2As over omega equals uh, uh, basically 2S over, okay, so let me, let me, actually I'm reusing A twice, aren't I? So let me put this as back to eta so we don't get confused. So we want 2 zeta uh, two zeta Oops, it looks like a five, okay. When you see five, you just pr pr pretend it's zeta. <laughs> That's why I hate writing zeta. Ah, zeta s. You know what, I'll just give you the answer because it's much easier. <laughs> I can't write zeta, it's terrible, okay. So we just want, uh, this is what the answer should be, b squared equals four a. If b squared equals four a, then you'll find that two, then eta is going to be one, or zeta is going to be one, okay? So that's the answer, b squared equals four a. If somebody can teach me how to write zeta properly, I'll be very obliged. But every time I write it, it looks like a, either I get a c with something like that, or I get a five, and neither one looks very good, so. That's, so that's the answer over here. These are the two answers. And so this hopefully gives you some appreciation of how we would choose um, the critical damping factor in a real system. So if you started this system over here, we knew that was the, time evolution of the output, then we kind of have, we know what, how to choose uh, parameters so that we get a critically damped uh, system over here. So one of the things that uh, I was trying to do as I wrote the, as I was writing the book was to come up with examples in computer networking as you've probably seen. And let me actually give you, uh, actually it's an open research problem. For those of you who are doing networking research, uh, this is a really lovely paper that you know, should be written except uh, I haven't got time right now to write it, so think of it as a nice open problem. 
Uh, this is what's called rod flapping problem. So let me explain what rod flapping is. And then the use of damp damping to reduce rod flapping. So as you know, we can kind of imagine the internet routes as being a cloud where internally we have some kind of graph. And the graph, uh, you know, some, some random, some graph. And so we, we view uh, essentially, this is the internet core. We have some uh, access network, which also has some graph. And then we have these linkages, typically one or two links from the access into the core, and then a symmetric axis outside. So let's consider some A, destination A, and it's trying to talk to some destination B, where we have the same kind of linkage like so. And it turns out that we can reach from A to B in one of multiple ways. Okay, obviously there are many, many different ways of reaching A from B, but I'm just going to focus on just a simple, let's just say we go like this from A, to B, or we take the blue path, we go like this, you know, from A to B, okay, where the path diverges at some locations, but obviously maybe it has to be the same, at least at the destinations. If you consider the orange and the blue path over here, in the internet today, by and large, we use a single path, we use what's called single path routing. So uh, a packet that is at this point over here, okay, the packet that's destined from A to B, that's at this point over here, can go into the orange path or the blue path. What the internet does today is that uh, uh, we choose the best path. So we say the best path is orange, let's put it in orange, and essentially all the traffic goes on orange. And uh, if for some reason the routing metrics change, blue becomes better, you'll switch everything off to blue, okay? So let's consider an, similar, an idealized situation where we have two paths from A to B where I've now hidden all the underlying messiness. And I just say there's two paths from A to B. And let's, for the sake of argument, let's say the equal, uh, let's say there's one packet per second is the processing rate here, one packet per second is the processing rate over here. And because the equal cost, I can just pick one, okay? And of course, I can make it slightly more interesting by saying this is one and this is 0.9, okay? But let's just say they're both one for now. So what's going to happen is if you pick this path, all the traffic is going to go from A to B. And let's say that initially you're going to send at the rate of one packet per second, so everything is fine, okay? Now a control system comes into play when you get a kick into the system. So how do we kick the system? We just say that suddenly we are sending at one packet per second. So this is your rate of sending one packet per second. And then you start sending at two packets per second at some point in time, at time zero. Actually, they're going to start sending a two instead of one. Now, <clears throat> what happens then is that we already selected this path as being the path to use. Our intrinsic capacity is two, but we're using single path routing. So all the traffic gets sent on the one, uh, so what happens is there's gonna be some buffer over here, and this, that buffer is gonna start filling up because you're sending faster than you can drain it at, so it starts filling up. And we can view this filling up of the buffer as being sort of this uh, energy accumulation. Remember when you pluck a string, you're accumulating energy and potential, right? And then you let it go, it becomes kinetic, and then you get potential kinetic kind of transference. In the same way, the packets accumulating in this buffer over here become energy. If you remember, uh, in the computer network, energy is unsent data, okay? Unsent data is energy. So buffers store energy. So when you have a buffer over here, restoring energy, so this becomes, has more and more energy, which is sort of potential energy. And at some point, what's going to happen is that the delay along this path is going to increase. The delay increases because this buffer is adding delay, right? At some point, you say, wait, wait a minute, this is not the preferred path. This path is too, too slow compared to this because we're measuring, typically measuring the cost uh, as end-to-end -end delay. And so this becomes the preferred path, and then we're going to send your traffic down here. When you send the traffic down here, you're sending still at two packets per second, because that hasn't changed. And this is still at one, so this is going to initially go through, but then this buffer is going to start filling up as well, okay? And then the delay is going to increase here. By that time, that's drained, because everything is going out, nothing is coming in. And so this delay is going to be lower, so you're going to flip back over here, and you get this oscillation between the two paths, okay? This is what's called route flapping.
Okay, you go from one route to the other route, one route to the back and forth. Okay, and if you do trace route, which is a tool for tracing route in Windows, you call it trace RT. In Unix, Linux, you call it trace route. Uh, if you do that to some destination, you'll actually find, in some cases, this flapping phenomenon going on. You'll go like this, and you'll go like that. You know, and it, it's a well-known phenomenon. And this is exactly an undamped system. Okay, it's an undamped system because we're getting oscillations. And so, what we really want to do is to remove the damping, and so remove the oscillation. And the way we do that is to add damping. And one way of doing that is to uh, persist in a bad route even though it's a bad route, okay? Because we don't want to be too responsive. So it says it's a bad route, we don't immediately jump here, because this may turn bad as well. What they do is say, okay, look, I know you're saying it's bad, it's all right, I'm just going to wait. So we add a, 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 a period during which, even if we know it's a bad route, we're going to persist in it, okay? You can call it hysteresis. Hysteresis is also a way of adding damping to the system. Alternatively, you can say, I'm going to split my load across these two links in proportion to the delays. Okay, so if there's more delay here, if the delay is going to be A over here and B over here, then the delay, the proportion of traffic is A over A plus B, B over A plus B. And this also actually adds a certain amount of damping because even though it's a better uh, 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 lower delay, we're not sending all the traffic there. We're being careful in splitting our da traffic here. So the research problem here, of course, is to model it as a control system, second order control system, model the energy properly, not just in this simple trivial model over here, but in this model where we actually have an OSPF in this case, which does allow equal cost multi-hop, uh, multi-path, and BGP over here, which is the uh, inter-AS routing protocol. And so how do we set up OSPF and BGP so that we get a uh, nice damped or a control system. This has not been solved for the last uh, 30 years, I'd say. So the papers are going uh, on, on damping and route flapping go back to at least 1989, uh, perhaps earlier. But, uh, and people tre keep trying to solve it, but they don't use control theory. They, they propose a solution and then they just simulate it and they hope it works. And of course, that's not a really great way of doing research. But at any rate, uh, this is a nice problem where the appreciation of a second order system is going to help. One, of course, we need to uh, first show its LTI, show that it's second order, and then figure out what control protocol to use and then what uh, policy should be done in the OSPF and BGP so as to get the right behavior. So that's why it's an open problem. <laughs> so if you solve this, you'll get a PhD and a great job <laughs> at any of the ISPs. Uh, it'll be a nice PhD to do. Okay, but as you can see, the heart of it is just control theory. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. So I just put this as two small examples in the in the book, but <laughs> there's a lot more to it. I, I didn't put. Okay. Okay. So finally, we can move on to um, feedback control. So uh, let me kind of do a little bit of a blurb on feedback control. Uh, feedback is probably the most important uh, uh, concept in control, okay? And, and at its heart, it's really very, very simple, and yet it's very, very powerful. And I'll tell you why uh, in just a moment. So the simplicity comes from the fact that we want some desired outcome. We know what the outcome we want is, it's our goal. And if you don't get to the outcome, we change the control parameters so we get to the outcome. And that's basically it. You know, how, how, much, how simple could it be? So you aren't where you want to be, so you change, where you want to change what you're doing, you'll get where you want to be, and the story. That's feedback control. The beauty of it comes from the fact that uh, because we are willing to change our input in response to what's actually happening in the output, uh, we become insensitive to or we're able to compensate for disturbances which are unpredictable, okay? So if I want to design a system so that no matter what disturbance happens in the future, I would like to have feedback control system, okay? So I'm going to go, to go back to politics for this. Uh, elections are basically feedback, okay? And a dictatorship doesn't have elections, right? So you choose the dictator and then after that, you know, there's no feedback. The, the dictator does whatever he or she pleases for the rest of his or her life. 
and then you know that's it. Whereas you have a periodic election that's feedback control. So you have a desired output, which is you know low taxes, everybody's rich, nobody's uh, unhappy, you know everybody gets health care, whatever it is. This is a desired.